And now, please welcome to the stage Mandela Washington Fellow, Sinatemba Twala. My name is Nethemba Twala. I'm a South African fellow and a, and a proud Mandela Hoki. As a young black woman doing her best to navigate her way towards becoming positively influential within my own community, it always brings me great joy to know women who have already conquered the mountains I am here to climb. The speaker I'm introducing today is a true embodiment of a title we call Wumandla back home. She is influential, she is powerful, and she is inspiring beyond words. She is president of one of the most influential think tanks globally called the Heritage Foundation, a foundation dedicated to promoting and formulating conservative public policies. A former member of the PNC Financial Services Group, she has served on numerous boards and commissions during her nearly 30-year career. A graduate of Hampton University and a recipient of numerous honorary degrees. And my personal favorite, she is an author of three books, namely, Never Forget, Transforming America from Inside Out, and what I wish I'd known before I got married. <laughs> and as if that is not enough, this woman is a wife, a mother of three, and a grandmother to five grandchildren. Back home, we would say she is basically doing the things that make the pots to be done. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Help me welcome on stage, Mrs. K. Cole James. I have been listening from backstage and you guys are rocking the house. I wanted to pick out my own walk-on song, but they didn't let me. <laughs> Have you ever heard She's a Brick House? <laughs> well, welcome. I understand that you have had a phenomenal time. True? Yes. Well, I want to thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight to listen from backstage at my very, very dear friend, Secretary Carson. Is he not phenomenal? Oh, such an inspiration to all of us. And I wanna thank uh, the US State Department for inviting me here today and for bringing all of you together to learn, to exchange ideas. And Lord knows we need it right now to help make this world a better place. I want to start out by telling you a little bit of my own story as an African-American woman here in America, a nation with a history of slavery, a nation that did not recognize black people's full rights as human beings until my lifetime, and even today we are not without our challenges. I want to tell you about what allowed me to get where I am today, serving as the president of a public policy think tank that has been ranked the most influential in the world. Yes. As a black woman, I have experienced both the inequality and the opportunity that this country has. And even with all that, I love this country and I've dedicated my life to serving this country. And I just want to take a few minutes to tell you why. 
Despite their flawed nature as human beings, America's founding fathers laid out the principles for forming a nation based on humanity's highest ideals. Nowhere else on earth had that ever been done before. Those founding principles have guided this nation and created a framework that has allowed our society to recognize the error of our ways. Yes, we are a flawed nation, but yes, our founders put in place those very necessary things to address those flaws. As a matter of fact, the fact is we abolished slavery. We even fought a war over it. It took us a while, but we ultimately recognized women's rights and minorities' rights. We have endeavored through our laws and our actions to eradicate the unequal treatment of fellow Americans for any reason. And so one of the messages that I need for you to take home is, yes, we are a flawed nation, but we have been gifted by our founders with the tools that we need in order to address those flaws and in order to be the freest and most prosperous nation on earth. I am delighted that we have the opportunity to host you here, that hopefully you can take some of those things back, but more importantly, I think it was important for us to have the opportunity to interact from you, to be challenged by you, and to learn from you. This has been a two-way street, an opportunity, not just for you to learn from us, but for us to learn from you. Unfortunately, this country had to grow into our principles. Our founders knew what we aspired to be, but the country wasn't there yet, and in all honesty, as I stand before you today, we are not totally there today, and we know it. So we're not here to say, come, look at us, look at all that we have, all that we do. Come learn from us. We've had many mistakes, many issues, many problems, and we are so glad that you are here, and we had the opportunity to be reminded from you and to learn from you. So what was it like for me? My story is not all that different than Dr. Carson's, but I think in understanding my story, you understand all of what this great nation has to offer, and there may be some tidbits there and some encouragement for you. I was born to a welfare mother, an alcoholic father. We relied upon public assistance in order to make it. I was born on a kitchen table because my mother couldn't afford the health care to go into a hospital. And I was delivered by a nurse midwife. And what I want you to know is that I grew up in substandard housing called public housing in this country. Thank God we have people like Dr. Carson who are overseeing those programs now and making that housing situation better and better. I can remember lying in the bed at night, hearing the gunshots in the community, falling asleep not by counting sheep but by counting the roaches on the concrete floor. And why do I paint this picture for you? I paint this picture for you because I think it is important for you to understand that with the right values, the right principles in place, and with the right forms of government, we all can make it. And your job is to take home all that you have learned and all that you have gleaned and make it better for the people that you want to serve. And so, yes, coming out of that situation, one of the things that I learned that there is nothing, and I will repeat, nothing more important than the family unit. And when the government couldn't step up and provide, it was that close-knit community and family 
that made it possible for me. My mother taught us at an early age that we were not victims of a racist, horrible country. My mother taught us that we were survivors, just like your moms and dads taught you. We are survivors. We're a bold people. We survived slavery in this country. We survived segregation. We survived the lynchings. We survived so much. And with a positive attitude, we were able to do that. And it didn't take a slogan to say that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. My mother knew it, and she said, at an early age, you will be educated, you will dress well, you will speak well. And you will learn all the skills that are necessary in order to lead this country. Now, there are a few things that I have gleaned from my own experience that I want you to take back with you. These are things that I think you already know, but they bear repeating this morning. You do know that we are counting on you. You do understand that you have a tremendous responsibility. You have been given much through this program, and I will tell you the same things that I tell my own children. You know that to whom much is given, well, So because you have been given much, you can't take all of what you have been given and be mediocre. You can't take all that has been invested in you and go home and do nothing. I am encouraging you to take all of what you have, all of what you have been given, all of what you have been blessed with, and go home and do something totally disruptive. <laughs> Too much has been given to you to be mediocre. Be disruptive. You have an obligation to the people who have sacrificed so that you could be here. You have an obligation to live up to the standards of leadership. I'm expecting nothing less than people of character, people of integrity. We don't have time to play. <laughs> this world is yearning for people with character and integrity and tenacity and people who are doing the right things for the right reasons. Be that person. And while I am encouraging you to be transformational, I'm asking you not to be that person that destroys tradition and excellence. I'm asking you to be the person that remembers the core tenets and you go back determined to make your country, your organization, your company, your community, and your families better. A couple of things that I have learned is that, uh, you know, being on the outside now and not actually being in government, I have a whole lot more freedom to say the things that I want to say. <laughs> Please, people, do not reject the things that got you where you are today. Go ahead now. All right, all right, all right. I do this on occasion. How many of you all come out of a church experience? 
You know you get a better sermon when you talk back, right? <laughs> I heard it. Amen. The guy in the back with the clock is going to say, bring it on home now. <laughs> All right. What is one of the main things that got us where we are today? Our faith. Don't reject it. Don't reject it as you take on the mantle of leadership and think that you are too big and too important to remember where you came from. Remember that it is your responsibility to reach back and pull along once there. Remember that the people that you surround yourself with are key, are important, are, and are vital, so they should share your values. Only surround yourself with people of character and integrity and people who want to bring about transformational leadership in your communities, in your countries. And I think one of the main things I want to share with you as emerging leaders is you can't take everybody with you. That was one of the most hurtful and discouraging things that I had to learn as God raised me up and provided these opportunities for me. And you need to be okay with that. You be you. You assume this mantle of leadership. You do what you know that you are called to do. And remember what my young son told me, because this is going to come back to you in a couple of months in another situation. You're going to say, that woman told me this. <laughs> Haters always hate up. So as you assume your leadership and the haters come out, remember that they are hating up, not down. And continue to do you. And don't step away from your calling and there are many that you cannot take with you. I would be remiss if I came and spent some time with you today and didn't share with you a little bit about the Heritage Foundation. And the reason I want you to know about this foundation is because I want you to know that we are here for you in your roles. For four decades, the Heritage Foundation has served as a think tank dedicated to the principles of free enterprise, limited government, individual freedom, traditional values, and a strong national defense. It is a conservative public policy think tank. By the way, let me get this out of the way. Someone always asked me, how in the world, as a black person, can you be a conservative? I always go straight to the issue. And for me, it's simple. My definition of a conservative, particularly a black one, is someone who has the audacity to believe what their grandmother taught them. It ain't deep. It ain't complicated. It's not controversial. And it's not hard. The audacity to believe what my grandmother taught me, because my grandmother was one smart lady, and she knew some stuff. We have long advocated for the economic benefits of free markets, whether they be in North America or Africa. We're committed to developing and promoting policies that ensure safety, security, and prosperity. Earlier this year at the Heritage Foundation, I did something that had never been done before, 
First of all, there's never been an African-American female as head of the Heritage Foundation, I'm just saying. And a dear friend of mine told me a long time ago, write this one down too, one of the only really bad abuses of power is to have it and not use it for good. So I decided, since I was the first African-American female president of the Heritage Foundation, and we had not spent as much time as I thought was important or necessary on the African continent, that I was going to fix that. And so at that event, I hosted many of your ambassadors from Sudan, Algeria, Libya, Mozambique, Tunisia, Cameroon, Uganda, South Africa, Tanzania, Namibia, Malawi, the Republic of Guinea, and several other nations. I invited them all for dinner. Next time, I'm going to cook, because I can. And we had a first ever meeting there to talk about the things that we share in common and how we can support each other. The Heritage Foundation wants to see not only America, but, and not only African nations, but every nation on earth grow and prosper. Because we are such an interconnected world, that success helps all of us. We have policy experts who research solutions in healthcare, the environment, energy, economics, taxes, constitutionalism, national defense, foreign affairs, and so many other areas of public concern. We assist the United States government in solving problems, but we also have foreign cabinet secretaries, finance ministers, ambassadors, and heads of state visiting our offices every week to discuss how we can find solutions to some of the most pressing problems that our world faces today. And I want you to go back knowing that all of those tools are available to you. As the Heritage Foundation president, I want to work together with you to ensure that our nations are free, democratic, and prosperous. I am here for you. There are nations around the world who depend on us and rely on us for the research and the data that we produce. And those who can't provide for themselves and rely on government and charitable assistance, those individuals benefit as well from what we do. As societies have become more prosperous, prosperous they've been better able to provide assistance to the poor. So we want to see nations prosper. When nations prosper, they are able to take care of those individuals who so desperately need their governments. Countries that have the most economic freedom also have more individual freedom. We got the data to show this. Think about this. Economic freedom translates into individual freedom healthier citizens, greater life expectancy, more educational choices, and even cleaner environments. Economic freedom also leads to innovation, leads to better jobs, better products and services, and better societies. There is not one alternative system, and many have tried, that has ever come close to the record of free markets in promoting economic growth and enhancing the human condition. But economic freedom is about much more than a healthy business environment where entrepreneurs can flourish and make big money and businesses can grow. It's about the freedom of people to choose where they want to work and what they want to buy and what they want to sell and who they want to sell it to. It's about freedom from excessive government taxes and regulations so that people can keep more of their own money when they make it. It's about your right to your property and a judicial system that protects those rights from the government or from your neighbor. Now, 
I know that there are some economic models being pushed on African nations that propose giving some limited economic freedom in exchange for a repressive government. Some of your countries are told that there's a trade-off between economic development and freedom. That political freedom is dangerous, creates disunity, and poverty. That if you want prosperity, you must give up freedom. Don't let anyone sell you that untruth. They will tell you, give all power to the government because the government knows best. This is absolutely false and it just doesn't hold up to the facts. Those who champion these models are concerned that individual freedom is a threat to the power of their ruling elites. The fact is human freedoms buttress economic development. The proof of this is that most of the freest nations in the world are also some of the wealthiest. There's an undeniable correlation between democracy and economic growth. Centuries of experience show that democratic principles provide the best foundation for building political systems that are responsive to ordinary citizens. When societies reject democratic principles, human suffering inevitably follows. Undemocratic systems care little for the individual's right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and ordinary citizens can do little to hold undemocratic leaders accountable. I am a living example of what can be accomplished in a country that's built on the principles of economic freedom and individual liberty. African Americans such as myself eventually gained rights in America because our democratic system couldn't tolerate the contradiction between its founding principles of equality and freedom and the enslavement and discrimination against an entire segment of its own people. The Heritage Foundation and I are tasked with carrying the message of free markets, free people to nations around the world. Because we are such an interconnected world, we want to see all nations grow and prosper because that success is success for all of us. As the United States' global role and foreign policy expand in new areas and in new ways, we are glad to see African countries receiving the attention that you so rightly deserve. In the coming decades, Africa's global importance will only increase given the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit in so many of its countries and the continent's vast economic opportunities. You represent the future of the continent of Africa. You are the next generation of leaders who will advance entrepreneurship, prosperity, good government, human rights, and a more hopeful future for those who come behind you. I am so proud to stand with you today. And the Heritage Foundation will be proud to work with you in the months and years ahead. I cannot tell you the joy that it brings me to be here with you today and to recognize that I am one of the last voices that you will hear as you are together before you head back home. Head back home and do some good. We are so counting on you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This makes my heart so happy. <laughs> now, I understand that I have a few minutes for some Q&A. Is this bold or what? They better be easy. Any questions? Yes. 
I don't know what the process is here. Should they just yell it out? Or are there mics? Or I see a microphone coming. Hello. Hello. Fernand Castro from Angola. I advocate for children, uh, underprivileged children. And I'm hoping to have you in Angola. My question is, America is great. Democracy is great. Is, when is America going to have a woman in the presidency? Because we look up to America for many reasons. But so far, you don't have women. And you talk to us about the women's rights and stuff. Sure. Please, that's my curiosity. Thank you. Let me start by saying I'm not running this year. <laughs> we have had some phenomenal women on both sides of the aisle step up. Um, you know, I was not shy about saying that this country was a little slow in recognizing some of the challenges that we have. Uh, we elected our first black president, and I pray to God that I live long enough to see us elect our first woman. It's coming. But I don't know when. <laughs> so important. Who's got the mic? You know, the lights are something I can't see, so I'll just wait until I hear a voice. Thank you so much. My name is Patu Ibrahim from Cameroon. I'm a diplomat and I'm a peace builder. Please tell us one thing you wish you knew before getting married. <laughs> one thing I wish I had known before I got married. I wish that I had known how incredibly difficult marriage is. Um, you know, I am an absolute and hopeless romantic. And I wish that we had spent as much time preparing for the marriage as we spent preparing for the wedding. I have now been married for 47 years to an incredible man. And when people ask me, what's the secret, I say, and he would too if he were here, we stood up in front of God, our families, and our friends, and committed to stay together forever. And so the reason that we are married 47 years later is because I said I would. It's that simple. <laughs> Having said that, I will tell you that with the rough spots along the way, and they are there, they are there. I said in year seven, I say this in the book, in year seven in marriage, I woke up and there was a naked man in my bed and I wanted him gone. <laughs> I wanted him out of my life and gone. And there were plenty of friends and relatives who encouraged me along that way. And I have to tell you that today, the ones who encouraged me to walk away have no idea the joy that we share. I wake up every single morning next to my best friend. I just wish someone had had the guts to tell me what was going to be required to make that happen. And for all of you who are in year one or two, it all just, and I do mean all, just gets better and better. I'm just saying. Thank you. Hello. I hear a voice. There's a question here. OK. So go ahead. Um, my name is Ike. I'm Nigerian. Where are you? I'm here. I'm, I'm here. I'm actually trying to oh, get there you. Oh, there you are. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks for your wonderful speech. Um, 
I'm Nigerian, and um, we Africans have a special spiritual connection to African Americans like you in the US, and we were privileged to meet a few black leaders who told us of some of their challenges, and um, it was quite uplifting. So my question is simple. Um, the current uh, political climate in America is one that is baffling to some of us, and that is what to some of you? Baffling? Baffling is surprising. Because like she said, or he said, we look up to America for a lot of things and we felt we were going someplace. So my question is simple. As a conservative woman, and not just a conservative woman, the head of the Heritage Foundation, I never even knew she was a woman and she was black. And we met a couple of black leaders in California where I studied and they shared some of their personal stories with us, some of their very close and um, touching stories with us. We met some, the mayor, a couple of people, wonderful. So really the black experience for you as a conservative woman, seeing the current political climate in America and what it portends for us Africans, because we feel bad when some of these things happen because it reflects poorly on us. Can you really tell us? Can you tell us, sorry. Leave can the you, brother alone, can you, he's gonna can get you, to it. Can you um, <laughs> give us, tell us why you stay where you are and what you really feel about this whole thing? Sorry for your time. What I really feel about about the current political climate and the what you can do. The current political climate in this country is toxic and bad. Uh, I cannot sugarcoat that for you. It is indeed. If you ask me why I am who I am and why I am a conservative African American, it's because at a certain point, I don't care if I am in a desert and I am thirsty and starving. When you offer me food and drink, first of all, I wanna know, is it clean water and is the food good to eat? And I'm not really looking at the hand that extends it. I believe that the policies that my grandmother taught me to be self-reliant, self-sufficient, independent, to protect our families, to stay married, all of those values, I don't even know when those values became conservative. They were just common sense stuff. And I'm not going to change because of the political climate. When I look at what's going on in our world and in our country and in our communities, I care enough that I don't care where the answers come from if they are the right answers that will save my people. And sometimes I may despise the messenger, but if the message is right, I gotta listen. So I would encourage you not to reject what you know to be true, because sometimes you don't like the messenger. Stick with what you know to be true. I know that it's important to get an education. I know it's important for us to form families and get married. I know that it's important for us to be self-sufficient and independent. I know that it's important for us to have a culture where businesses can grow and people can earn and keep money. I don't care who says it, if it's right, it's right. And so I have to figure out how to take those messages and articulate them in a way that's outside of the political climate and environment. I don't do politics, I do policy. So. Hello? Hello. I'm the other side, can you see me? I see you now. <laughs> Hi, my name is Vital Sunvu. I'm a Mandela Washington Fellow from 2014, five years ago. Um, ten years ago. Only fellows are taking questions right now. I'm a fellow yeah. too. From this year. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Sorry. What a discrimination. <laughs> I'm missing Thank all of you. this, so I hope y'all know what's going on over there. What was going on is that because we are ancestors, they assume we couldn't talk. Just saying. My name is Vital Sunuvu. I'm from the Republic of Benin. Five years ago, I was fortunate enough to be at UT Austin for the YALI, and driven by 
one single purpose, linking American SMEs with African SMEs. Why? I was born in a country where economic opportunity is scarce. Millions of African young people today are building incredible companies but cannot grow because there's no access to basic, capital? basic, no, capital I think comes after basic trade opportunities, being mm. known, and for the buyer to know that you exist. So we created an e-commerce marketplace, helping African companies export. But here's my point. In an era where Africa has the largest free trade area in the world, and where we have Agoa right now, where we can ship and trade with the United States free of tax, I believe this is the best time for, for American SMEs to collaborate with African SMEs. So how can we collaborate with you to make that happen? You can go right on the website, look at heritagefoundation.org. I am one of the easiest people on the planet to find, and I am ready to collaborate and make it happen. How easy is that? And I already told you that I'm a woman of my word. I'm married because I said I would be. So there you go. I will do two more, and then I have to go sit my hurting hip down. Um, wow. Okay, so hello. Um, Hi. My name is no. Victor Nale. I come from Uganda. I'm differently abled. I'm stayed here. Um, I have two questions. My first question. No, you get one because she's one got one. Sorry, I have one question. What inspires you every day? The second, I want to have a hug. <laughs> Can I have a hug with you? Oh, of course. I give out hugs all the time. What inspires me every day? My grandchildren. I get up every morning and I go into the Heritage Foundation and I fight because. Listen to this, because this is important. I refuse to leave my grandchildren an America that's less free than the one I inherited. I care about the future for my progeny. I care about the world that I'm leaving them. And so while I am definitely of retirement age, go ahead, tell me I look good for 70. And I should be sitting somewhere watching I Love Lucy reruns. I get up every day and I go to fight because I care about them. So that is my inspiration. It, it disturbs me what I see happening in our country today as I see freedoms erode. And it's not going to happen on my watch. It's just not going to happen on my watch. Last question right here. Yeah. So um, I'm Valeria Ajatia from Ghana. I'm an agro processor and then I advocate for persons with disability. So my question is this. Um, looking at you here is so inspiring to me, especially coming from a, a marginalized uh, community. What I want to find out is this. You have geared us up. You have inspired us. We are ignited. How do we keep this fire on when we mm. get to our home countries? When we meet these difficulties, these challenges, these obstacles, how do we go beyond them and keep this dream alive in us? And then secondly, what do your foundation do with persons with disability? Yeah. Thank you. This is what I call a mountaintop experience. You come and you get fired up. You get motivated, you get inspired, but it is no good at all if you don't take that energy, that excitement, and go do good. We don't have the, we don't have, it, it, it's just not for us to be able to come and have experiences like this and then go on with business as usual. That's not an option. 
People are counting on us. Your grandchildren, your children are counting on you. And if find out whatever that motivation is for you to keep going. I have told my own children that the only difference between a failure and a success is the successful person gets up. We all get knocked down. You are going to, when you leave here, get discouragement. You're not going to get that loan that you thought you were going to get to continue your education, or it isn't going to work out as you thought it was in business, or you're not going to win that local election. But if that kind of stuff stops you in your tracks, then you haven't proven that you've got what it takes to be a leader anyway. So the answer to your question is, how do you keep it going from the sheer, the sheer sort of true grit that's inside of you, the thing that compels you to want to make your countries better, the lives for people in your community better, for your families. That has got to be sufficient to keep you going because no outside force will. And when you get knocked down, the only difference between you and the successful person is you will get back up. So when you go home and you get knocked down, I want you to hear that voice inside your head saying, get up, because that's your charge. Get up and do good. Thank you. Listen.